Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Sam's Report. I'm the executive editor for Blue Web Web Media Group, Brad Sams. And today, what is today? Today is September 30th, and it is the end of the week of Ignite. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, gosh. Um, what a crazy week. Uh, traveling to these things is always fun, but it's also always terrible because I get extremely far behind on everything that needs to be done because it's, it's hard to hang out. Um, and do writing and do everything else, uh, especially when Microsoft announces so much stuff. Really, there was a ton of stuff this week, but let's let's dive into what happened on throughout this week because it was a lot of stuff. Uh, forums are now live. The new comment system is new live now live. Um, so I, this came up actually a couple times at Ignite, and I just wanted to just kind of reiterate why we went with this comment system. People, there were some people who were upset that we left discuss, uh, even though we have been able to social logins and. I'll go more on that in a second. So here's the problem we had with Discuss. Uh, we have obviously the premium subscription service. We also, we also now have a forum and we also have comments. We actually went to Discuss and said, hey, we, we want to be able to use the social login and build a forum and do all this stuff with just one simple login on a WordPress site. And unfortunately, they came back to us and said, that's not possible using Discuss. So that is why we had to get, uh, get rid of Discuss. It's not that we hated the platform. There were some things I didn't really like, but at the end of the day, it was that we needed one login for the site and using Discuss, that was not possible. Now, granted, we are on version 1.0 of our forum system. We're actually looking at, or forums and comments for that matter. We are looking at new features and how we're going to change that. We just wanted to get it out the door, get some feedback, and then we can iterate. Uh, because as anybody who knows in the development world, once you get it out the door, it's a lot easier to refine and make a whole lot better. And that's our intention. But first, the next thing we have to do is actually launch the new front page. So next week, um, hopefully, I, I'm hoping Monday, but I'm, we'll see. I'm hoping Monday, but we'll see. Uh, the new front page forum design, forum, I keep saying forums. The new front page design will go live. Uh, it features a bigger emphasis on video, but it's not a huge dramatic change. And there are options to make it look like it does similar to today, not exactly today. So if you like the current layout, that will not be completely going away, but there'll just be more options. And I think a new default option for how the page will load to new users, but that is going on. Uh, always listening to feedback. Please, please, please use the forums. If you have comments, feedback, whatever we do read them, Tim is actually a lead designer and he is in those things like crazy looking at all this stuff. And that's really the best place for us to capture all of it. Uh, Twitter is great and don't get me wrong. Twitter's fine. But at the same time, once it's off the screen, then it's gone forever. Uh, so, we love that. Anyways, podcast. So Paul, Paul and I started our podcast this week at Ignite, uh, First Ring Daily. We did two episodes of it. And starting Monday, <laughs> we're going to have a dry run here this afternoon. We got to make sure all the technology on the backside is actually working. Uh, it'll start Monday. That's the intent. So be on the lookout for that. And I know everyone's asking about RSS feeds and we are on it. It's just with Ignite traveling and everything else, RSS feeds were kind of a, a, a later priority because we needed everything to work first, but we are going to get that figured out. I promise you, because I know the importance of RSS feeds. I use RSS feeds for podcasting and all that. And so they will come, um, just need to get through that. So that is what's going on in the world of Throt. And now we jump into what is going on in the world of Microsoft this week. Oh my God. Uh, Ignite crazy off the hook. Um, it's an IT pro show, but there was still a lot of stuff, but anyways, uh, for those who watched actually the first ring daily, um, I now have the new outlook, which I, I discussed last week, but one of the issues I had, which I noticed late last week was in the mail app, Microsoft's windows 10 mail universal app that once I got the new, uh, setup that right mouse clicking on an email, I could no longer move it to junk. Now this was really perplexing to me because on the old system I had it and on the new one, I didn't have it. And so I I updated, I made sure I was running the latest app and all that stuff and it was gone. And then magically like two days ago, it just showed up. So I don't know if it's like a provisioning thing, like you get the new system and then they kind of like add in the feature. I don't, I don't quite know what they're doing on the back end, but it took about two days. And then all of a sudden, uh, I had moved to junk back. So uh, a lot of people were asking about that still. And so there we go. Uh, speaking of mail, by the way, so we, we talked about this a couple times in the show and actually I got a good, really good tip. Uh, from Simon, he sent this in. So if you go back to build 2016, um, I think it's at about an hour 14, it's either an hour 14, hour 34. And it is when Marcus Ash is doing a demo of Cortana on stage at build. 
there is an Outlook app that looks really like a modern app. Now, people were saying uh, when I tweeted about this and was sharing the image that they don't really think that is a modern app, but it is It is Outlook. I mean, it's a mail app that does not look anything like the mail app we have today, and it does not look uh, like the Outlook traditional desktop application as well. And so I've often wondered, are they going to build an Outlook mail app? And so uh, I had a session, a one-on-one -on -one session at Ignite with uh, the head or a head or PM of marketing. There's so many like lead people inside the Outlook people, but he's definitely on the marketing side of Outlook. And he told me that they are not planning on rebranding the mail app to Outlook on Windows 10. So when they say desktop Outlook, they mean the Office 365, you know, the full blown Outlook. And they don't, they weren't planning on re renaming the mail app uh, to Outlook. He did not comment on any features, but one thing he did say, and so they're working on this right now. There is going to be an update coming to mail. Right now they use Exchange EAS, uh, Exchange would have Active Sync or Active Server, um, that's built into Windows 10. And then the, the mail app reaches out to the Windows 10 version of it and it goes and grabs your mail and brings it in. What they're going to do in a future version of the mail app, I think it's coming with the next release, or maybe it might be independent because it is just an app, is that they're actually going to bring that Exchange Active Sync information into uh, the mail app. Actually, I should look at my notes. They might even be dropping that all together now that I think about it. And they're going to bring all that into the app. So it should be a little bit faster at syncing email and a little bit more responsive is the idea. So be on the lookout for that with the mail app. Uh, but really, I want to... I, I need to like ping Marcus or somebody and ask them what they're doing with that Outlook app because it's it go look go look at it go look at it it's right where they did the Cortana demo like jumping through the calendar and all that stuff it was it's very clearly some sort of modern Outlook implementation so anyways uh, Ignite this week one of the big things that Microsoft finally I shouldn't say finally that's not fair to them. Uh, one of the things Microsoft updated us on is actually the active install base of Windows 10. Uh, there's now 400 million active installs. So the question is, is that a good number? The last figure we got was 350 million around the end of, I believe, June it was. So they've added another 50 million active users, which is a good number. 400 million is nothing to, nothing to be upset about. That's, that's Honestly, it's a huge amount of users. But the question becomes is, are they going to be able to hit their, or when, I should say, are they going to hit their 1 billion? I, I do believe that they are going to get there. Uh, one, things we, one of the things we did learn is that Accenture, a really large consulting firm, says that they now have 100,000 people move to Windows 10, and they have more users to move. So their companies are starting to slowly move uh, from Windows 7 to Windows 10. And so what I think we're going to start to see here is more large companies. We've already been, it's already been out on the market for a year. Uh, Windows 7 still has a lot of longevity left. But as we'll talk about later, uh, if you really want to get the full benefit of the Microsoft world or ecosystem, you need to be running Windows 10 and the latest Office 365. So 400 million, I think the next kind of big chunks, uh, the enterprise is starting to kind of kick online with that stuff. And there's hundreds of millions of users there. But also don't forget that new hardware is now coming with Windows 10 and roughly, roughly on an annualized basis, there's 200 million new uh, OEM PCs that come out each year. So at next year at this point, uh, it should be roughly around 600 million or so. And then you go a year later, it should be roughly 800 million. And so they really need about 200 million uh, left to get to the 1 billion, which I think they'll be able to do. I, I, I think they will get there. So 400 million, it's good. It's not crazy good, but it's not bad by any means. I, I We never really got Windows 8 numbers, but we know that they were pretty terrible. And I wonder if... Windows 10 is actually, I, I would bet, I would have to think at this point that Windows 10 has completely passed everything that Windows 8 has done in terms of install base. So that was one thing. Uh, so this is actually find really, really interesting. It kind of plays up into the narrative I'm building up here is this edge secure browsing environment. Microsoft announced a Redstone 2 feature at Ignite. And what it is, it's a secure browsing mode for Edge. And it's not like uh, containerized things we've seen elsewhere. What this is, and it's for the enterprise version of Windows 10, uh, an IT pro can go set up a whitelist or a known good site configuration for its users. And if uh, Joe user clicks on a link and it takes them to a, a bad or malicious site, uh, or basically any site that's not on the whitelist, what happens is, is it opens that edge session in a containerized, virtualized environment that's actually, they said, I believe, running on the hardware. 
itself. Um, so it's not fully Hyper-V, they, they said, but it takes some Hyper-V features. And what this does is it allows that instance of Edge to be completely isolated from the rest of the operating system. And that's the difference between what some other uh, packages do. Uh, you, can, you can buy software that does similar stuff to this. But that's the big difference, is that it's completely isolated. And so if that link is bad, and what Microsoft calls link uh, detonation, is if it tries to you know, infect the user's machine or whatever, that instance just collapses and shuts down and it's done. So it's really a security feature that's built in, and it's going to, Microsoft believes, stop a lot of those just kind of bad downloads that people, that happen, you know, inside the uh, environment. I don't have an exact quote on this or stat, but I would have to think that the biggest threat to an enterprise is actually probably the employees. The second biggest threat is probably like a hacker or whatever data leak, because, right, if you're already inside the network and you click a bad link, that is significantly worse than somebody who has to get into the network and then activate uh something malicious so that is coming with redstone 2 they didn't uh i couldn't find any demos one of the issues they have currently because i did talk to them about this is actually performance as you can imagine if you're running in an isolated container on a virtualized system uh, on a pc there is some performance issue they, they noted like things like streaming video because it's uh, the way it's isolated there's no hardware acceleration currently uh, it, it struggles a little bit same with like really graphically intensive websites so it's not perfect but that's kind of where it's at today. So that is coming with Redstone 2, and kind of really one of the first Redstone 2 features. Actually, we'll talk about another one later. Uh, actually, we'll talk about several later. So we're kind of starting to see this little like drip feed of what's gonna be in Redstone 2. So that's one of the things that's coming to the enterprise. Other things announced Microsoft, other things Microsoft announced this week are the Office 365, uh, what I'm just calling a security layer. Now, there are some advanced threat protections that currently existing today in Office 365 E5, which I believe E5 is the highest. Uh, if not, it's it's just about the highest. E3, I think, is the entry level for enterprise and E5. Anyways, so there's what they announced this week is that Office 365 advanced threat protection is being extended to Word, Excel, PowerPoint, SharePoint Online, and OneDrive for Business. And they also announced that Office 365 threat intelligence will provide alerts and information on the organization origination, sorry, of specific specific attacks inside your environment. Okay, so what does that garbage that I just vomited out mean? Here's, here's the scenario. Let's imagine you're an IT, you're in an environment, and a user gets a, a malicious phishing email, or one that even has a virus, whatever, and they open it, and advanced threat protection immediately determines that, hey, this is a malicious file and it came from an email because they can look uh, with Office 365 E5 that, with this feature. They can now look at that in real time and determine it is a malicious Excel document. And then what happens, and this is kind of the magic of this stuff, is that advanced threat protection will go back up to the server and say, who else got this email? And then it will actually go out and claw back that email or prevent the user from opening if they can't actually stop them uh, if it's already on their local machine, they can't pull it off, but it'll actually stop them from opening it. And so this is the power of what Microsoft, Microsoft often refers to as the Microsoft graph, Microsoft knowledge graph, Microsoft security graph, that type of thing. And so this is a really powerful tool that now where there was once 20 attack vectors because of that document was emailed to 20 people, once one person determines it's malicious, it is immediately removed from the environment across everywhere. Now what's even cooler about this is if you're an Office 365, uh, whatever, the, the, the E5 subscriber, if you're at a completely different company, uh, let's say, let's just say you're at uh, Facebook and Microsoft got attacked by this phishing thing. Because you're all interconnected on the, on the back end infrastructure side of Office 365, Facebook is now protected from that same threat because Microsoft can digitally determine what that malicious file looks like. Now, granted, everything is anonymized and they made it very, very clear that no enterprise data is uh, compromised or exposed to anybody else. But really what you're now leveraging is the entire Office 365 ecosystem of users to better protect your environment. So Facebook is now protected against that same malicious Excel file almost immediately as it's determined to be malicious. And now imagine you can that when there's mil well there already are millions of people running this. This is a huge security blanket that Microsoft has built in the cloud. And this is where the title of this uh, podcast came from: the Microsoft Pivot. Uh, and I really believe this. This is going to end up as a premium article, likely on Therat. Uh, for those of you who aren't subscribing. Um, I recommend you do, first of all, because the premium uh, alpha badge, the 
uh, discount rate ends, uh, I believe Monday. And so, oh man, it, this is, this is crazy to me. So the Microsoft pivot, here it is. Microsoft is a productivity company that, that is not going away, but really underneath that, what they are is a security company. Think about it. Think about this. Think about what they announced this week. They announced uh, new security features for edge. They are turning office 365 into a security layer for the company, right? What basically what I just described is very hard to replicate. Anybody can go out there and build a word processor. We know this. Google has, or their G Suite, as they now call it, as Google Docs. Um, Apple has iWork and all that stuff. It's not hard to build a word processor these days. What is hard is to get the, inherently hard, is to get the security right, the data protection, the ability to look at content and um, viruses in real time and be able to protect the entire environment. That's what Office 365 now offers. And it's not just productivity, it's a security blanket is what Office 365 uh, advanced threat protection is now offering. Same with Windows. Windows, let's let's kind of just be real here for a second. A lot of things that you can do on a, on a work basis can now be done in a browser. Not everything. I know if you're running AutoCAD or video editing, it's not perfect, but a lot of things are now done in the browser. A lot of enterprise, uh, software now runs in a browser session. And so you don't always need Windows. You could do that from a Mac and theoretically on a Chromebook too, but you're not gonna get the same level of protection in your internal environment. That's why Microsoft is pushing this security memo so deeply into their products because they know that if they get security right, then people have to use their products because imagine the scenario that a CIO is sitting there and saying, well, you know, uh, this we would have been protected. We wouldn't have had 100 million uh, accounts compromised and all our data stolen if we would have just been running this skew of Office 365 or running uh, Windows 10 Advanced Threat Protection. That's a really bad place to be if you're CIO. So what Microsoft is doing is trying to build the best-in-class OS, browser, and productivity suite with the best level of data and security protection. It's a really interesting move. I was actually... Uh, uh, I was talking to Microsoft... Um, about this and they're like you know that's a really interesting perspective and i was like really guys like you didn't kind of pick up on this narrative that was being announced uh, somebody had to have but that's the microsoft narrative now it's productivity in a secure environment in a secure world that's what microsoft is offering and we know this because here's another scenario an example of this outlook the accompli acquisition that microsoft bought uh, it's Outlook, rebranded Outlook. Accompli was actually running an AWS. And so how this product works is you have your email exchange server, and then Accompli sat in the middle, and then you had your inbox, which is uh, what's on your phone. And Accompli being just their service in the cloud. And what happens is, is the cloud service would connect to your Google account, your exchange server, your Outlook.com. And because each of the systems is different, they may not all have the same feature set. So what they did is they pulled all your email into AWS, and then they could do fun things like uh, focused inbox because they now had all the content in a centralized database. They could manipulate it as needed, and then it would be delivered to the end user on the client on the phone. And this is really convenient because then the client on the phone is actually really fast and nimble because it only needs one set of APIs up to AWS. Now, that is how Accompli worked. And so once Microsoft bought it, it said, hey, we can't really run on AWS. Mostly because uh, <laughs> enterprise companies don't really like the, th the thought that their email is sitting on another server that they don't have control over. But now that it's been brought into Azure, a company now, or Outlook, I keep calling it a company, now Outlook, that intermediary section, now lives in Azure in the secure and protected environment. And that's why that was a big deal because now Microsoft can guarantee the protection and encryption of that data, whereas previously they could not, which is why they're now pushing the Outlook phone app uh, to enterprise users. But again, it's all about security. Microsoft is building itself up as a security vendor who makes great, a great operating system and a great productivity suite. So that's kind of that, that's, that's kind of where I think they're going with this stuff. And that's how they're going to differentiate all their products going forward because it's hard to compete against an up and coming, like Google Docs, there's, it, there's really nothing wrong with Google Docs if you're just a single user or just two or three people, it, it's fine. But once you get into the enterprise side where you need that encryption, you need data protection, you need it, uh, loss prevention protection so people don't steal your data, that becomes very hard to add. And that's Microsoft's value proposition. And so that is the great Microsoft pivot of 2016. Actually, this has been in the making for many, many years. It's a really fascinating way about how Microsoft is ensuring the longevity of their company.
So we've all known that Azure was the backbone. And now that they have the Azure backbone, they were able to build up this entire security platform using the data and users that they have to protect everybody who is inside of that. So the reasons, the question instantly becomes, well, couldn't AWS do this? Uh, they could, they could very much do some of this. I mean, Microsoft does this as well. So if people are trying to hack AWS, then they can harden down their environment and help protect their users. Same with Azure. But what AWS does not have, it doesn't have Windows 10, it doesn't have a, a local operating system, uh, and it doesn't have a productivity suite, at least yet. So I'd be curious to see if Amazon would ever go down that route. That'd be a pretty big shift for them. But there you go. So other things announced this week at Ignite. Uh, Windows Server 2016 and System Center 2016 are now coming in October. That was pretty much a given. That's not really surprising anybody at this point, but Microsoft made it official. They didn't announce a date, but they did say mid-October uh, for this kind of stuff. So, moving on to hardware, actually quite a few questions came in about this. Uh, is there still an October event for this month? So, I, I still believe there is. The thing is, we will not probably get invites for probably, if it's at the very end, like rumors suggest, and which from what I've been hearing is accurate, uh, we're probably about two weeks-ish away from getting an invite, or from those going out. They like to do them 10, four, 10 to 14 days out uh, is typically when this stuff goes out. So we're still a little bit away. But anyways... Uh, if I had some confetti, I would I would light it off or light it off. I would make it explode before I make this next announcement. Uh, placeholders. Microsoft showed off placeholders. Now, I'm going to toot my own horn here for a second. I actually first wrote that Microsoft was bringing back placeholders in December of 2015. And at the time I originally wrote it was coming with Redstone, what I thought was going to be in Redstone 1. I didn't, if you actually read the post, I said everything's always subject to change. Features got cut. Actually, this feature did get cut. Um... And you know you can kind of tell that because of how quickly they announced it following the release of the anniversary update. But yeah, placeholders, they, it's coming back. They showed it off uh, in a session. And so let's just kind of talk about how this works. Placeholders work that if you open up File Explorer and you navigate through OneDrive, you can see everything that's in the cloud. Here's an example. Uh, I have a couple terabytes of photos in, uh, or not terabytes, a couple gigabytes of photos stored on OneDrive but I don't want all those on my machines. Like my Surface Book only has 256 gigs of storage. So how this works is I can open up OneDrive on my local machine and I can see those files in the cloud, but they're not actually downloaded. And so when you double click one, it hydrates as Microsoft calls it and it pulls it down, populates the file, and then you can open it. And because it, they're relatively small, it's a very quick process. And what they showed off here is OneDrive being open and showing little cloud files on files that are stored in the cloud and green check marks for files that are stored locally. And you can basically sync on demand. Now don't get that uh, don't get that confused with demand sync, which they announced on demand sync, which they announced today. This is individual files. Uh, it is coming though. And it, it's it, it's coming. Like this is fantastic. They're they're working on this. It looks like they finally figured it out. Now the, here's the bad news. Like if you had like a womp womp womp, like a nice little trombone, uh, it's not coming for a while. They actually made an update on their user voice page that they would talk more about it at build. So we're many months away from learning more, at least seeing where. I guess they could potentially give us previews of this stuff uh, in. I don't know, the VMs, or not the VMs, the, the fast ring. I run the fast ring in a VM. So I guess we could potentially see it there, but they explicitly and publicly stated we'll talk more about this at Build. Let's talk about Build for a second. Um, heard some slight information. I don't think, I don't know if Build's going to be held in San Francisco next year. I'll just leave it at that. I don't know if it is. Uh, and it also, I, I don't know if it's going to be held at the same time. So... We'll see what happens. Uh, don't take any of that as fact yet, but, you know, just kind of rumors floating around. Uh, rumors from people who would know. Uh, I don't even know how to call them rumors. People in the know uh, suggested this information, um, and we'll just leave it at that. So if you were planning on going to build in San Francisco, it may not be there. Um, don't get me wrong. They're still having build. It just may not be in that location. So what other things went on this week? And actually, this is where some of the fun gets started. Uh, Microsoft delivered a new build of Windows 10, 14936 for both PC and mobile. And let's talk about mobile for a second. Microsoft said uh, they actually had a session about, hey, what's going on with mobile? And so here's fundamentally what I believe is happening. First off, what they announced is some updates to Continuum 2.0. Great. Uh, 
just new features. You can check it out and run up on Throp. But more importantly, what is the future of Windows 10 Mobile? So we started to see this already, that Microsoft is making the Windows 10 Mobile more and more and more exactly like the desktop just shrunk down onto the phone. And that's what I think they're going to do. They're going to just make, they already did it with the settings. I think everything on mobile is just going to be a collapsed version of the desktop. Like almost like one-to-one -one parity, like extremely close. And the benefits of doing this is that it becomes extremely, extremely easy to maintain Windows 10 mobile right? You don't have to put a lot of resources into it. You can keep it coming. It'll keep getting new features, just scaled down. And I think that's where they're going because obviously we know they're not making huge progress. They're not gaining market share and they've kind of given up on their own hardware, at least for now. And I think that's how they're going to keep the platform alive until they kind of figure out mobile or I don't know, whatever. So that's really what's going on. Uh, but what, ha what, what happened in this new build there's, there's new Edge extensions, and Microsoft is making a big deal about this, and it seems almost odd that every time there's new extensions, they're like, hey, there's new extensions. Yeah, um, I hope that's not a habit that they're just going to announce every time they get a new extension. But anyways, there's some new extensions out there. Granted, that's great, but whatever. Uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux uh, will also soon be updated so that new installs will utilize version 16.04 instead of the current release, which is, uh, I believe, 14.04. Here's the thing, though. Uh, existing install installs will not up be upgraded automatically. So if you're going to upgrade your Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows, which is a mouthful to say, uh, there's documentation available. Go check out the, the announcement blog, and you'll be able to see that there. So other things that were announced, uh, not announced, but uncovered in 14, in this new build, 14.936. Jeez, I can't get that out of my mouth. Is the term home hub, home, H-O-M, E H U B is now showing up in this build. It, it was uncovered by quite a few people and many wonder, is this the new surface kind of all in one monitor thing? So I don't, I don't quite know. I haven't figured out exactly what home hub is. A couple of thoughts. Uh, and the worst case scenario and worse being like, not worse, but whatever, just this is what it is. So it could potentially be part of surface hub uh, because surface hub does run windows 10. So it is a possibility that it is just part of that. And it's just kind of people have uncovered it. And this is, nothing. Um, on the other side, Home Hub could be the Surface all-in-one or some sort of IoT device-centric or software-centric thing. I don't know. If you know what the Home Hub is, you know, give me a shout-out. I would I'd be very curious to see what other people think that the Home Hub is, but that name has shown up a couple different times in 14936. Other things that are now showing up too, and this one isn't too crazy, so for a while, we've been hearing, hey, Microsoft's building a modern file explorer. Well, what's available in 14936 is that you can now actually access the modern file explorer from Windows, you know, the ones that ship on the Lumias, right? Windows 10 Mobile has a file explorer, and you can now open that actually on the desktop if you know where to go find it. So I don't know if they're going to fully, like, if that's just kind of an accident, or they actually are going to build out the modern file explorer for the desktop, but hey... It's, uh, it's there. So other things going on this week. So this one, th this one's very odd for me, why it took so long. Microsoft Store is finally offering Windows Hello peripherals. And so I don't know if they didn't exist and that's why, but they're now selling fingerprint readers, uh, a couple different versions of them. It's like, wait, I think Windows Hello has been out for what, like 14 months now. 14 months and they're finally getting that stuff into their hardware stores. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'm kind of hoping they actually start to carry the new Razer, what is it? Stargazer, uh, webcam just because that's has windows. Hello support, I believe. So yeah, we'll see. Um, what else has going on? So Skype for teams. This was fun. Uh, people asked about this in some private press sessions and Microsoft gave me some nasty looks. Uh, Skype Teams is coming around. I actually got some more information on it, and once I get a few minutes to breathe here, I'm going to write it up. Uh, likely, I'm thinking Monday. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to it this afternoon, but I got a lot more videos about the stuff and just kind of shows off how Skype Teams works, and people seem to be extremely interested. In I know I am, so look for that to come here in the very near future. I want to jump into the reader questions. So just so everyone's aware, I am going to start posting threads. Now that we have a great forum, I can do this. 
uh, on the Throt forums about how to ask questions for the show. The reason why I don't look at the comment section, or not the comments, the, the YouTube chat, I actually do look at it. Don't get me wrong, it's open right now. It's very hard to be able to read those and keep a coherent conversation going at the same time. So I'm going to try to put up a thread each week, and that way people can ask questions there. And we got three for this week. Um, um, Adam Jarvis said, this isn't so much a question, but I said, hi, Brad, can you give a call out to important uh, Windows 7 update? Windows 7 patch KB3172605, uh, which actually fixes the Windows 7 SP1 12-hour checking for update problems. So if you if that if that issue that the Windows 7 12-hour checking or update problems has um, affected you, that has been fixed. Uh, other things that have been asked in the in the forums. This is any information from Ignite on new announcements slated for October. No, that's not wasn't really expected. Um, I was actually, to be honest, a dis- little disappointed they didn't talk about Skype for Teams at Ignite because that was like the perfect place to announce it. But anyways, uh, no nothing about that. And then Eric asked, said, do you see a hardware type device similar to the Amazon Echo but powered by Cortana? So uh, there are rumors um, that Microsoft is already toying with this and actually building it. Um, I haven't heard that myself. I think it would make a lot of sense. I do wonder if they don't get it out for like this holiday season, I think they're going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, we already know that Google's building one. Uh, Apple is believed to be building one. And so it seemed to make sense that Microsoft would actually try to build one too. And kind of thinking about it, it seems like Microsoft should have a pretty good advantage in theory, if you think about it, because Cortana can be run on any device, right? Uh, including your Xbox. So Everybody, most, anybody who'd be interested in this device, let me qualify to that, would probably already have a device in their house that could run Cortana that could then sync all this stuff. I would actually be really interested in it too because I don't think I can actually sync Amazon Echo stuff to the desktop here, to my desktop here, but I know I can sync the Cortana stuff. So from that angle, it'd be quite uh, interesting. So we will see what they're actually going to do with this Amazon Echo device. The thing is, Amazon crushed the competition to getting out in time. That's what's like so fascinating about this stuff to me is Amazon announced this and the whole world was like, whoa, like really Amazon? But I have an Echo and I use it just about every single day. So, oh gosh, Um, insider tip of the week. So this is actually a really good tip. I'd like to think that every tip is really good. Microsoft is posting, I believe, just about all their sessions from Ignite online. And you can go watch any one of them. Uh, you can, I'm waiting to see if the placeholder one comes online and to see if they hack it out. Uh, but I've already gotten a couple tips this week of people finding screenshots of Microsoft employees with Skype for Teams open, or at least on their desktop. So make sure to go check out those videos. You know, poke around, do some sleuthing, as I like to call it, and see if you uncover anything. Remember, these are all Microsoft employees. There's a very good chance they're running Canary Rings or potentially newer rings than uh, we have or from a different branch, depending on who it is. So there's probably a lot of good information that was just overlooked unless you have a really keen eye. But that's the insider tip of the week, guys. Stick, stay tuned for next week when we launch our podcast every day. Uh, this has been another edition of the Sam's Report. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a great weekend.